recording tape um, using sticky tape and sprinkling some rust powder on it. We need a little bit more. I just have to rub it into the sticky side. Get off all the excess. Right. Right. Now we we record some sig we put it in an ordinary audio recorder. Uh, yeah, I think I've got it in the right place. Ready? Okay. Yep. This is recorded on sticky tape and rust. This is recorded on sticky tape and rust. Right. And now what we have to do is to play it back again. Uh, the right way round. Put it in. Right. Okay. okay. This is recorded on sticky tape and rust. This is recorded on sticky tape. Well, the start of it was very good. <laughs> again. I don't know why the, why did the quality go down, do you think? I think it probably fell off the caps from there. Well, it proves the principle anyway. The ring-shaped recording head with a gap that's been used ever since was also perfected by the magnetophone company. Here Rex has made a giant model of one. If he covers it up and sprinkles on some iron filings, you can see how the gap concentrates the magnetic field. Now when he pushes a model of the tape past the gap, you can see how it's magnetised. The smaller the gap, the smaller the magnets created on the tape, and the more information that can be recorded on it. That's why video heads are so small. The gap on the heads on a domestic video machine have to be exactly three thousandths of a millimetre across. They're the most accurately made thing in the home. It's amazing that something so tiny can record anything at all, but there really is something quite magical about the properties of magnetism. Usually my work is making models and special effects for the film, television and advertising industries, and I use magnetic effects an awful lot. Simple ones for conjurers and illusionists and party tricks is to get something which is obviously non-magnetic, like an ordinary match. You can actually... Uh, make them dance. For a simple magnetic trick like this, you need two obvious things. You need to drill the middle of the match and put an iron pin inside. And of course, you also need Tim underneath the table with the magnet. You're all right under there, Tim. And there's the magnet, which we did the trick with. But of course, sometimes you need much more sophisticated applications for magnets. And I did one years ago with a friend of mine and we had to make a magnetic mint. As you can hear, it rattles. And uh, with a magnet under the table again, you can control it beautifully. You can make it go backwards, you can make it turn, you can swing it round again. So you've got full control over it. Magnetic recording of sound is relatively simple. Recording moving pictures is much more difficult. In one second, a video recorder has to record 25 complete separate pictures. Even on a domestic video recorder, each picture is split up into over half a million elements, and the colour and brightness of each has to be recorded. In one second, an audio recorder only has to record about three words, the average speaking speed. Hundreds of times more space on the tape is needed to record pictures instead of just sound. Good evening. I want you, first of all, to look at this clock and to remember the time that it says just after 9.16. Now, the reason for asking you to do this right at the beginning of Panorama tonight has all to do with Vera, the Vision Electronic Recording Apparatus. The new machine, which is in programme service tonight for the first time at the BBC's research department at Nightingale Square in South London.
there she is. Richard Dimbleby demonstrated the BBC's first attempt at video recording in 1956. To record enough information, Vera had to move the tape past the head at about 20 miles an hour. Just after nine, the results six, were shown by replaying the start of the programme. asking you to do this right at the beginning of Panorama tonight has all to do with Vera, the vision electronic recording apparatus. It got the nickname of Wobbly Television and was very short-lived. Well, there you are. That's where we came in, in a way. That was the beginning of Panorama tonight, just about five minutes after I first did it. This is now me again, really. Today, all video recorders work with slow-moving tape. To make enough space, the heads have to record a series of diagonal stripes across the tape. These stripes are created by spinning the heads round on a drum while the tape moves slowly past. Here we've replaced the heads with the uh, pens and if I thread up a bit of paper with Rex, I think that's in all right now, okay, you should be able to see a stripe being created. It's the tilt of the drum that makes the stripe diagonal and by the time that one stripe's reached the top, the tape will have moved on just far enough so that the next stripe doesn't overlap. Of course, in the real machine, the stripes are much closer together. This machine's all still connected up. And if Rex and I lace up a bit of tape, it's a bit tricky to get it right, OK. You can see that uh, when the tape's stationary, the heads are, the spinning heads are reading one stripe over and over again, and this produces the still picture. Moving the tape uh, backwards and forwards, oh, we're not on a moving bit at the moment. Uh, yeah, moving the tape backwards and forwards changes the picture. It's not a very good picture because my fingers are creating quite a lot of interference. And of course, if you move it at 25 stripes a second, it replays the tape exactly as it was recorded. Oops. Spinning the heads is a much more practical way of recording pictures than speeding up the tape. The idea comes from this German military machine, the Tonschreiber. Based on the magnetophone of the 1930s, uh, this machine was used throughout the Second World War for broadcasting propaganda speeches and martial music. Its sound quality was much better than anything the Allies had. It's a bit difficult to get it to run at the right speed. Um... <laughs> After the war, many of these machines were captured and two found their way to a Russian engineer living in California called A.M. Ponyatov. He ran a small firm producing electric curling tongs called Ampex, AMP after his initials, plus X for excellence. Ponyatov wanted to develop the machine but lacked the capital. Fortunately, he found an enthusiastic investor keen to develop new ways to immortalise his stage performances, Bing Crosby. With Bing's money, Ampex audio recorders soon became the industry standard. Unlike other companies, Ampex started its work on video by experimenting with spinning heads. There were formidable electronic problems to be overcome to squeeze the video signal 